This is episode 81 with Doug Stewart. Welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, the show that empowers you to become the hero of your life's journey. With your host, Brian Tier. Forgive yourself for your weaknesses and double down on your strengths. What is up, everyone? This is your host, as always, Brian Tier. Welcome back to another episode of the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, episode 81 today. And those were the wise words of my good buddy and repeat guest here on the show, Doug Stewart. Now, in case you missed him back in episode 22, Doug is a coach, trainer, speaker, and vlogger, as well as, as one of my favorite past guests on the show. Now, Doug and I spoke about his inspiring story in our previous interview of pretty much overcoming every learning disability you can think of and becoming a TEDx speaker. But what I didn't know when we last spoke is that Doug has been building up his own coaching and speaking business on the side for the last six years while working a full-time job and making time for his family. Recently, Doug was able to leave that day job and go full-time with his own projects, and I decided to bring him back on the show to talk about that journey. And of course, we got into some other good stuff like time management, working for free, and faking it till you make it. Now, in this episode, you're going to learn how to build your business on the side before quitting, how to combine practicality with your passion, how to use your day job to build the skills you need, how to tell if something should be a hobby or a side gig, why work-life balance is a myth, how to know when it's time to quit, and should you fake it till you make it. As always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in this episode at bryantier.com slash 081. And uh, just a quick shout out again to our sponsor this week. It is Rooster, the awesome alarm clock app that allows you to wake up to something a little different, you know, not that boring normal alarm tone that you're so used to and hit snooze on, but voice notes from friends and family, inspiring channels, uh, news headlines, sports news, and much, much more. You can check that out at Rooster on the Google Play Store or the App Store. But for now, guys, let's go hang out with Doug. Welcome back, everyone, and a big welcome to today's guest. I'm so excited. You can probably hear. We're welcoming back Doug Stewart. Doug, welcome back to the Quarter Life Comeback. Brian, what's up, brother? How are you? Uh, I'm I'm super well, and I'm I'm so excited to be speaking. You've uh, you know we've become really good buddies online, and uh, you know the the cool thing is I've been doing this podcast for so long, like we were discussing beforehand, that some of my guests have had amazing transformations themselves since we last spoke, and so I'm I'm kind of in the process now of getting some of those people back on, and you're one of those people. So I think today might be a bit more of a fly on the wall kind of episode, and and just kind of catching up and uh, seeing where you've come from uh, the la- since the last time. But uh, for people who didn't hear the previous episode, why don't you give us a brief, brief background on uh, you know who and what it is that you do? Sure. So uh, last episode, I think, was episode 22 that I was on with you, with you and you've, you've had a lot of podcasts yeah, since like then. 60 weeks um, but, ago. I, but I... I know it's it's crazy how much has happened since then, but just a just a just a brief um, brief overview. So I was I was a kid that was born with a bunch of uh, learning disabilities that um, really made excuses and uh, was luckily given some athletic ability and able to go to college anyways, despite you know dyslexia and. Uh, speech impediments and ADD and narcolepsy and various other things, and really was uh, met by a a educator who disrupted me and 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 showed me that um, I was not uh, I would my value was not on a piece of paper and my, neither was my potential, and really encouraged me and broke me out of of this victim thinking and allowed me to uh, leverage my strengths and forgive myself for my weaknesses. Uh, as a result, I've I've owned a couple of businesses, um, had a bunch of really cool and interesting jobs, and uh, now I find myself. Uh, in uh, approaching my mid thirties, um, in a place that I never thought I would be, being able to help people I never thought I would be able to help, and being able to do work that um, 
that has meaning and that I believe is making a significant difference. So that's that's my story, bro. Yeah, it's super cool. I, I'm going to link um, up to episode 22 in the show notes. It's still one of my favorite after all this time. Um, and the thing that I you know, always remember from that first episode is how you said that we're not defined by the labels that people put on us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you had almost every label you could think of and... Um, you, you've still come out and doing amazing work, helping people transform their lives. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll definitely link that up and I urge you to all go uh, listen to that one. But uh, what's happened since last time, man? So since, since last time, I think last time we spoke, I had just given my, my TEDx talk on mentorship. So we, we really talked a lot about mentorship. After that, it's, it was unbelievable how much credibility the TEDx talk gave me. I mean, it immediately sort of launched my speaking career. Um, in fact, in fact, I got a call like a week after I gave my TEDx talk, like it's not online yet, by a company that said, hey, um, we saw that you gave a TEDx talk about mentorship. I said, yes. And they said, we'd like you to come do it. What's your fee? It's like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. That is insane. And uh, I said, hey, were you there? And she said, no. I said, well, how did you see it? She said, I didn't. I just know that you gave a TEDx talk and I'd like you to come come, uh, come speak to our group. And it just blew my mind just the fact that I had that on my – just the fact that that was on my resume um, meant that people autom- automatically believed that I was a certain level of speaker and worth a certain amount of money, which was, which was really crazy cool. So that sort of started um, – and then, and then I essentially ended up quitting my job about, I don't know, it's been about a month now. Um, and, and I've been working on that since about 2011. So that's been like a six year journey. Um, but quit my job to do, um, my, my own business, which is essentially teaching Dell Carnegie programs as an independent contractor, selling Dell Carnegie pro- pro- programs as an, uh, independent contractor, as well as my public speaking and coaching career. Um, and boy, was that a big jump. Amazing. And did you have a speaking background before that TEDx talk? A little. I was a trainer, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I had I, I I spoke to groups pretty often, but as a as a mattress trainer, I, I grew up in the furniture industry, and so I, I was I got a lot of practice. But the practicality of you know getting up and giving a really powerful or insightful or talk about leadership or communication or some of the things that I talk about now. Um, isn't something that I did a lot of early in my career. I talked about mattresses, <laughs> like I was a, I was a sales rep for Tempur-Pedic. So um, you know the correlation. I don't really know. Um, but from 2011 till the time I gave my TEDx talk in 2016, um, my training really happened in the classroom in the Dell Carnegie program mm-hmm. and going through their programs and 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 learning how to give an effective, um, well thought out um, uh, uh, talk. Mm-hmm. As, as, as well as being able to really connect with people on a human level. And so I was getting a lot of training in the background and probably more than I, more than I could ever afford because of the apprenticeship um, that I was given with Dell Carnegie. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, not a, not a huge speaking background so up, cool. up to that point. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, you'll know a TEDx talk is high on my my bucket list. Um, and I, I think I'm getting closer and closer to that. I you know, there's going to come a point where I turn all this stuff that I've collected from these these interviews into a book and a, a you know a, a talk series, uh, and and a TEDx talk. But yeah, it's so cool how that kind of catapulted your speaking career, which is kind of your new side gig now. Um, but you you said something that's really important, I think, for people listening to to remember. You said you've been building up to this point over the last six years. Tell us a bit about that. So when when that started six years ago, it only started because of a of a dramatic failure that I had. I grew up in the furniture business, like I said. Um, my my grandfather had a retail furniture store. He started his company in like 1969, grew it up through the 70s, 80s, and 90s up to five locations. And so everyone in my family, I was either going to or coming from a furniture store my entire our entire childhood. I grew up there. We ate like we ate dinner there at night. Like I, I was just in the furniture store. And you so when I was about twelve bed. years old, <laughs> there's no question I could pick a good bed. When I was when I was twelve years old, my grandfather put me on his sales floor. You know, he he taught me how to sell. He taught me the business. And so it was just really natural. I saw the success he had. So it was natural for me after college to come home and go into the furniture business. 
um, I found because of, you know, uh, you know, certain circumstances, some, some being, you know, the, the truth is that sometimes family business doesn't always work out the way we'd like it to. Uh, there was some real communication gaps in the family once my grandfather um, passed away. And so I decided that I needed to get out of the business. And when I, I walked away from the bit, I walked away from my family business, which was a dramatic failure in, in my estimation at that time. Um, in the same month of October of 2011, I walked away from my business. Um, I took a, I took an entry level sales rep position. My wife uh, quit her job and we had our, 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 our little girl Kendall. And so, you know, in a 30 day period, we lost essentially everything we had been planning to have. Um, and added a mouth to feed 70, you know, 70% of our income or so. Uh, and it was, it was tough, but I, but I also knew that entrepreneurship was in my bones. You know, I knew I was built for it. And so I started building again and I told my wife to give me two years and I would get us our, us financially back where we were before. Um, and we were back in about 18 months, um, went through a couple of, you know, promotions and then essentially had, I don't know, six different jobs between 2011 and, and, and this year, um, just kind of building and being really strategic about the way that I, you know, I, I grew, grew myself, um, to ultimately be unemployable <laughs> and to, and to have my own business, um, and apprenticing and working with Dale Carnegie and, you know, just side hustling my face off. Um, and, 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 and essentially it ended up, Brian, it ended up being just, pu just putting a, a level of practicality into my passion, you know, and, and not, and not just jumping ship. Like, I think if I would have been, if, if I would have been in a different place, maybe I, it would have taken three years or two years, or maybe I could have done it immediately. But the truth was, was I had a, I had a family to provide for, mm. you know, I had, you know, I had. I had a standard of living that that was important to me, and I didn't I didn't want to make my my wife and my daughter struggle um, because I had this thing in me, you know, like that that I wanted to do. I was I was willing to do the work and 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 make the transition easier. Um, and also, man, the the truth was is my what I wanted to accomplish I wasn't ready for. Like I didn't have the skills yet to coach on the level that I wanted to be helpful to people. And so having those jobs being really systematic and practical about the jobs that I took to help me prepare and help me train and being super patient in the long term and then really impatient in the day to day, meaning I, I, I didn't care how long it took. And in terms of that, like long term patience, I couldn't care less. But short term every day, I was I was completely impatient with my development and I worked and I worked and I thought and I read and I, 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 was, I was mentored and I, I apprenticed and I stayed up late and I got up early um, and, I, and I did what it took and I, you know, it took six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, you know, when you say you, you read and learned and that stuff, th that's not easy for you. I know you you mentioned in our last episode, uh, because of the, you know, the, the conditions that you uh, were blessed with. Um, <laughs> right. And when I say read, most of the time, what I really mean is audio book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I loved how you said you side hustled your face off. I think I'm going to make that the, <laughs> the quotable. But uh, so... I love how you said you brought practicality to your passion. And what uh, one of my mentors back home here said to me was, um, there's nothing wrong with taking a job if it moves you towards the network or the skills that you are trying to um, sort of achieve and develop. Right. Is that what you're getting at here? A hundred percent. And and look, I, I think I was just, I was really fortunate that the thing that I was the most passionate about gives me the opportunity to, to, to make the most money. Like, you know, I don't, I don't think that's true for everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think it's important for people to like really be practical and think to themselves, is this something that I can make a living doing? And if it's not, then let it be a hobby and be really happy with that. And then find a job or find a career that, you know, doesn't, doesn't make you want to, you know, run away from it. Yeah, I think you know? there's, I, I've mentioned this in a couple of previous episodes. I think there's a kind of an unhealthy idea these days that 
you have to be making money from something that you're passionate about. And it, right. it's kind of like we're moving away from the fact that some things can just be a hobby that you do for pleasure and, and fun. And like it does, you don't have to monetize absolutely everything. Um, That's right. And sometimes that kills the joy, right? I mean, some of it's just flat self-awareness. It's like I was, I was reading a thing. This was years ago, so I'm going to butcher this paraphrase. But I was reading an essay from Henry David Thoreau and he was talking about how a group of men will get on horses and they'll chase a fox around a countryside for hours on end for abs- not only for free but they will pay crazy amounts of money for gear and equipment to go do this hard work all day long but if you offered them money to do it they'd never agree to it mm. because sometimes the things that we love to do is it's the difference between a social norm and a market norm, right? So when you think about like, I was talking to a buddy about this the other day, like I read a book called Predictably Irrational years ago. Um, and it was, it, it's about how irrational uh, the human condition is. And it's also completely predictable in what way it will be irrational. And so he taught, he said, you know, what would happen if you show up to your, to your um, mother-in-law's house. Uh, and actually this is, this is probably appropriate for you being a newlywed. What would happen if you show up at your mother-in-law's house um, for Christmas dinner and you take her, you know, you buy her a $30 bottle of wine or so, uh, and you hand her that bottle of wine and say, thank you for hosting Christmas. Um, we're really excited to be here, right? She would be touched. She would take the wine. She'd probably give you a kiss on the cheek and it would get your, your, your dinner would get off to a really good start. Okay. So, so what if instead no, of the wine, <laughs> Right. What if instead of the wine, right, you walk in Christmas, Christmas dinner, you see your mother in law, you reach in your pocket, and you pull out thirty dollars, the same amount of money that you paid for that bottle of wine. You handed it to her and said and said, thank you so much for hosting. Here's a gift. She would probably be insulted. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's the same amount of money. But sometimes some things mean you know, it, it means something different to hand someone a bottle of wine first. And so the whole point of that is is the self-awareness around if you do something for a career, will you love it as much? Mm-hmm. For me, I, I'm lucky enough to do that. That's not always true for everybody. And so I think bef- like in the very beginning stages, you have to think to yourself, if I wasn't ever going to get paid for this, would I still be willing to do it? The answer for me with Dale Carnegie was yes. Like I didn't know, I didn't even know I would ever make a career out of it or if I would ever have a chance to get paid doing Dale Carnegie training for like two years. And I still did it. And I still, because, because of what I got out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to get to that in a second, but before I do, we, we mentioned like in-laws and, um, like kids and marriage and all that kind of thing as a, as a newlywed, like you mentioned, I, I'd love to find out how having a wife, but even more so, um, Kendall, your daughter, how that kind of influenced how you showed up as an entrepreneur. Do you think you would have had that same level of hustle and determination if it was just you? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think so. And and the reason I think so is because, because of the way I was trained. You know, I, I grew up only around entrepreneurs. I didn't, I didn't like, I grew up in a very small town. And in my experience, I know this wasn't the reality. This was my experience, though. In my experience, there were two types of people when I grew up. There were the entrepreneurs. Actually, there were three. There were the entrepreneurs who had who were successful. There were people who worked for the entrepreneurs who weren't as successful. And then there were people that worked in the factories, right? And there, that, that was only the three, like, categories. And so for me, it was like, I just want to be an entrepreneur. Like that's that's all I ever wanted. And my grandfather instilled in me this crazy hustle. And he he was he he worked six days a week, right? And I can remember growing up, he would tell me, like God created everything in six days, and then he rested on one day. Mm-hmm. That was the model he had for us as human beings. And so we will work six days a week. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that's just that's just the way he rolled. And so that was just the modeling I had. That's 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 just what's in my gut and it's what I like to do. So is that healthy for everyone? No, probably not. But boy, it, that that's just the way I'm that's the way I'm personally built. So you're still working six days a week now, or is that just a, a metaphor for the hustle? That's 
that's just a metaphor yeah. for the hustle. I don't work six days a week now. I would tell you that if I if I didn't have a family, I would probably work more. Um, but it's it's the it's the balance, right? It's it's what's important, and you know I have to consi- con- consistently check myself, and my wife really helps with that in checking me. Yeah, totally. Um, to, to to make sure I'm not overworking because I really have a tendency to to do that. Because and the other part is that's my hobby, like my work. The thing I get paid for in my hobby are the same thing. Like I don't go, I don't, I don't go play softball or, you know, like I'm, I'm not part of a basketball. Like I don't, I don't do those extra things that some people do to like wind down, like to wind down. I watch Ted talks, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I, I listen to an audio book, like the thing that, the thing that I do for a living, I also do for a hobby. And, and, and I don't think many people have that same, have that same thing. Not in my experience anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm glad you mentioned that you know you wouldn't have you wouldn't have hustled harder if you didn't have a wife and kid because now everyone listening doesn't have to go and get someone pregnant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but um, aside from that, so something that I've been battling with is balancing like you know do I work harder now in the beginning of both my sort of entrepreneurial journey and our marriage so that we can enjoy the the sort of lifestyle that we want to live later on or do you need to kind of make time for things now how did you experience that did you did you work longer hours in the beginning or um did you always kind of make time for everything you know it's i think i think a lot of it especially when you're talking about a a, a marriage relationship a lot of it ends up being communication you know like my wife and I had different definitions of what working hard looked like. So, so her dad was in the gas, the the oil and gas business. He had an incredible job, incredible career. Um, and he worked nine to five, five days a week. Um, I grew up with a fa- an entrepreneurial family that we worked, you know, six days a week from 9am to 8pm. And so our, our ideal for hard work was different. Mm-hmm. Like her dad worked super hard. And, you know, my family worked super hard, but the way we thought about that was different. So it was, it was getting ourselves on the same definition, right. Of like, of, of what hard work means and what family time means. And then, and then knowing that with the, with this career and this life that I've chosen um, to go down, balance isn't something, you know, we talk a lot about work-life balance. Balance isn't something that's really in the cards for me. Um, Totally, man. Oh, it's just not. I completely just, agree. The, yeah, and, the analogy that I use is like, I actually don't think there is such a thing as work-life balance. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I told this to a client of mine. It's kind of like the tightrope walker. You always, you know, a tightrope walker is never balanced. They're always right. slightly leaning to one side and then you have to counter and slightly lean to the other side. Um, but that's how you get to the other side is, you know, it, it's a constant to and fro. You you said it you said uh, you said it exactly. It's it's counterbalance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's counterbalancing your time, counterbalancing your attention, and so you know the way I think about it is, is similar. I think about it like a scale. Like you think it like the really old school scales, the ones that have like mm-hmm. like the the tray on one side and the tray on the other, and you 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 weigh certain things against each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you know, I'm I'm constantly putting you know work on one side of the scale, and it becomes unbalanced. And so I have to find a way to take on that other side and, and put massive amounts of time into quality time, like evenings, like, uh, you know, having breakfast with my daughter, like, and counterbalancing those things in a way like I have, I have less balance than, than a lot of people with a real job, but I made sure that I was there for my daughter's first day of kindergarten. Yeah. You I, know, I'm laughing because you say real job. <laughs> <laughs> right. I still love that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I can't get my I still don't think this is a this is this and and the truth is it's not a real job. It's 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 a it's a hustle and it's a it's a business. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't I don't have a job, I have a business and that's kind of the way <laughs> I guess that's the way I but maybe that was a Freudian slip a little bit. Yeah, I like that. Uh something that I think is really valuable about the the journey that you walked over the last 6 years is that you worked for free for a long time with the Dale Carnegie stuff. Uh, oh, Carnegie, sorry. Um mm-hmm. and I've spoken before about how valuable that can be. I I first came across the concept via Charlie Hone and how he'd worked for Tim Ferriss for free. Um and basically what he said was like, you know, reach out to someone um who you would 
pay to work for basically offer to help them for free and then you know really over deliver and, and pitch at the end um i wonder if there's anything else you wanted to add on on the value of working for free in the beginning stages you know a uh, apprenticeship is is a really old idea but boy i think it's one of the most valuable things we can do especially for especially for people that that are younger right when you when you don't have you know the responsibility of um of of like <laughs> We said real job, real adulthood, right? And your expenses are crazy low, and you have time and you have evenings. Like, what do you get at? What do you get out of going to the to the bar four nights a week? Like, okay, it could be. I guess it could be fun. It could be you know stress relieving. But how much more valuable is the investment of giving your time to someone else that you're going to get something else for? You know, I think about I think about relationships sort of like I think about banks, right? Like if I were to go. If I were to go down the street to the bank, this this about two miles from my house today, and and have never walked in that bank before, have never made a deposit, and demand them to give me money, they would throw me in prison for trying to rob a bank, mm -hmm. right? The only way that I can get money out is if I put a deposit in first. Otherwise, I'm either a bank robber or I'm in debt. I don't want to be either one of those things. People are the same are the same way. The in in order to expect to get things out of relationships, you first have to make deposits into them. And the best people to make deposits in, particularly for your career, are people that can actually be helpful to you. And the best way to get them to be helpful to you is to help them. <laughs> like I worked for free for two years and, and every time I was getting stuff out of it, like I was, it was, dude, like, I don't want to look like mother Teresa here. I was being completely selfish. You know, I was going back and thinking, can, and I would, I would tell my wife, can you believe they're letting me do this for free? And I was getting to sit in classes that cost, you know, $2,000 to attend because I was helping and I was apprenticing. And so I was getting just as much out of that. And, and after, you know, a couple of years of making those deposits, those time, energy, effort deposits and being as helpful as I could, I got an opportunity to an opportunity, not, not like I wasn't just given this, this is something I had to spend two more years studying. Um, but I get an opportunity to become an instructor. Um, and that would have never happened if I hadn't given the, given the, the effort and giving my time away for free, you know, time's, time's the most valuable thing you can give someone. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to do something pretty, pretty fun right now. Uh, I, I, I've spoken about, uh, I've spoken about this to Taryn recently and I'm looking to bring on an intern or apprentice to help me with some aspects that I want to kind of pass on and in the process, like mentor that person as well and help them move towards their goals and that kind of thing. So if someone's listening to this, this is the first time I've made it public, uh, get in touch. I'd love to have it be someone from my community um, and we'll we'll see where we go with that. Uh, but getting back to, to being able to quit, did you think about quitting, um, you know, beforehand, like during those six years, did you think about quitting earlier? And um, if so, how did you counter those thoughts? I knew I wanted to have my own business. So it was, a, I had to quit to do that. So it was a natural thing that was in my mind. Um, in, in fact, the, the last couple of jobs that I had in while I was negotiating the, the job, I, w I tried to negotiate a contract instead of a instead of an employment position. And it just didn't work out. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just, I just, I just knew that the time would come when it was ready. And so I thought about it in terms of revenue, right? Because like I said, I, I have a business, not a job. And so I thought about the revenue for my company. So the question became, uh, or, or the, or the, or the idea became when the revenue of my company gets to a place that can sustain me and my family without putting pressure on my wife and daughter for the transition and, and their lifestyle, then I can quit, <laughs> but not a second before. And I was willing to wait it out. Like this happened even actually before I thought it would. I, I thought that it would take probably another two years and I was willing to do that. And luckily I wasn't working a job I hated. Like mm -hmm. I was working a great job with great benefits, with great income, with really good people doing work I liked. Like, 
like it wasn't a bad yeah, like yeah. I wasn't in this place that I hated. You know, I could have stayed there and been successful and relatively happy, you know, for the rest of my career. Um, mm-hmm. That's just not what I wanted. So, so the advice for people listening, if they they're thinking of quitting to start their own thing, is do it when the time is right, and the time is right meaning you know when it's at a point where you know you can kind of pick it up from the salary that you were making. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say do it do it when you can tolerate the risk. You know, I didn't want to tolerate a lot of risk, so I was willing to do it for longer than I had to. Um, so that I didn't put any pressure, but like if, if you've got, if you, if, if, if it's just you and you can live with like eight dudes or eight ladies as roommates and, and make, you know, eight, eight cent an hour doing your side hustle until you build it up, like, like quit yesterday. (laughs) Like it's, it's a matter of, I think it's a matter of your, your tolerance for risk and your tolerance for, um, for lifestyle. Like if you feel like you, you need to be able to like afford to eat out, like at a restaurant, then you might need to wait. Mm -hmm. But if you can eat ramen noodles every day for the next two years, while you do this, like I would have grown it faster if I would have had more time. Like I had a 40 hour a week job that I was working and then giving, you know, my, my side hustle another, you know, another 20 or sometimes more. Um, I, it, it's this this is just what worked for me mm-hmm. and what made the most sense for me but if you have tolerance to like like you like you're you're a similar story right you just you just quit <laughs> you know yeah don't and, do that and, <laughs> don't do right. that but 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 you got so much out of it though you know mm-hmm. what i mean like it it ended up working out really well for you and you have a level you you have you have an understanding of the world around you that 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 experience informed you of that you wouldn't have otherwise. Like, like it, it may be reasons to believe if you didn't have that experience, you wouldn't be maybe as effective as a coach and a mentor today to other people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You see, you you see where I'm going? Definitely. But you also maybe, I mean, would you, would you, would you do that now? I mean, you've got a wife, you've got, you've got a son, like, would you do that now? No, (laughs) of course not. Of course not. Definitely. So, so, so we, I mean, I, I, I really struggle and I really am try to be really careful about ascribing my ideals onto other people's decisions, (laughs) you know? So I think the advice is like, know what you want, know what you can tolerate and go do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, just do it. The thing that keeps people from, I believe this. And in fact, I had a, I had a coaching conversation with a guy yesterday and I told him, I gave him the same advice. I said, it's, it's not a matter of what's going to happen. It's a matter of what you're going to do today. What are you going to do today? How, what are you going to do to get you one step closer, one idea closer, one, one inch closer to where you think that you want to be? And if you hate it, then iterate and do something else. Like you don't have to know what the end is to start. Just start doing something today that's going to get you closer and you can you can iterate on that on on that thing. Mm-hmm. I love it, uh, dude. I, I this is, this has gone super fast. Um, but there's something that something that you mentioned, which I just want to kind of explore a little. And that was that um, it was something along the lines of you said you know what you wanted, you know the business that you wanted to create, and you didn't want to quit until you you know got to a point where you could coach to the level that you want to coach and and that kind of thing um and you had built up those skills where where do you see or how do you consider the that that slogan of fake it till you make it of you know do the thing or kind of put yourself in the situation until it becomes your reality versus like build up those skills and then be like cool i'm ready for this I think I think people people connect with us through our vulnerabilities more than they cr- connect with us through our victories, and so the idea of fake it till you make it I think is is misleading, and it just that just that quote fr- is can be a little frustrating, and so I don't think that I'm a good coach because I know what people should do. I'm a good coach because I can hold up a situation kind of like a, like a prism. You know how, you you know, if you hold up a prism to the sun, you can see as you, as you turn it, you can see different colors come out of it and other and new colors in it as you turn it. And, and I think 
That's what I really was trying to develop. Not that I know everything, but that I can hold up a situation that a client has and I can turn the prism and I can ask questions around it so that they can make their own decisions, right? Like I think that a great coach doesn't know the answer. A great coach helps their the person they're coaching get their answer. Totally, totally. <laughs> right? And so the way I think about fake it till you make it, I think people see through that. Like you'll be found out. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I don't, I don't, you know, thinking really quickly thinking about my career, I don't think I've ever faked it till I've made it. And that's been one of the things that's really connected me with people on a deep level because I've never pretended to be something I wasn't or to have a followership that I didn't. And I just said to people like, like, look, I'd, I'd like to be helpful. I don't, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but let's talk through this. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's made me an effective coach. Not so much that I'm a, I'm a guru or a sage. It's that I am also doing my work and offering an opportunity for, for other people to come along on the ride with me. And it's that authenticity that I think people connect with. Not, you know, we don't follow people because they're the smartest. We follow people because they're the most caring and the most empathetic. Mm-hmm. Those are the people that we, that we love. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned how you don't have to like have all the answers um, to be a coach, because that's that's I think that's the the thing that people think is like, oh well, how can that person be a coach when he hasn't gone through something like that? Um, right. And the example that I like to think is like, you know, all the top athletes have coaches. Um, mm-hmm. Let's let's use like Michael Jordan for example. If his coach was if, you know, if you use this example and say, well, his coach must have had to be better than him to coach him, well, then right. he wouldn't be a coach. He'd be the best basketball player in the world. <laughs> right. But it's, right. it's it's a skill set and it's a it's a way of being able to connect with people and, and ask the right questions at the right time. Um, but anyway, another thing, and uh, I do want to start heading towards the wrap up here, but uh, just one final thing. And that's something else you've started creating um, along this journey is your your vlog and your podcast now. So tell us uh, what we can expect if we go check those out. Sure. So so I started started a vlog just just to give myself a creative outlet and to sort of document my journey. Um, and I'm still you know I'm still figuring that out and working through it. I think I'm on I'm on eight eight episodes of the vlog right now. Um, and it's a lot of the stuff is just kind of like stream of consciousness and kind of day in the life kind of a stuff. Sometimes it's more one than the other, uh, which is a lot of fun. I, I, I host that on YouTube and, and Facebook. Um, but YouTube is YouTube slash Doug Stewart 919. All of my stuff is Doug Stewart 919. Um, the, the most the most recent project has been my podcast. So I've got a buddy, his name's Mark Kinsley, and he's just, he's really a kindred spirit. He's one of those guys, you know, every once in a while that I meet people like Mark or like you or like Jason Goldberg, right? That, that I just feel that kindred spirit. They like, they, they get, they see the world in a similar way that I do. They have a similar work ethic, a similar hustle. And, uh, we would have a conversation about once a month and it would always just be this epic conversation that, that I would get off the phone and just wish my clients or my Dale Carnegie participants or, um, my friends and family would, would, would get the same things I would. So one day I called him and I said, Hey man, what do you think about just like having these conversations more regularly and recording them and just putting them out? And so we do a podcast called the Off the Top Podcast. It's just him and I working through what we're creating and what we're building. And also we field some questions every once in a while. Uh, and, and it's just a lot of fun. And it's one of those projects that it may it, there may be a thousand episodes, but we might actually never do another one again. <laughs> and like It's just one of those things that just worked out this really fun. And so you can find that on uh, on iTunes. That's you can you can search it by searching my name, Doug Stewart or um, the Off the Top podcast. Yeah, I, I'll uh, put the links to everything in the show notes. Uh, Doug, I do want to come uh, to a close here. Is there anything else you think is worth mentioning for people listening? You know, I think the biggest thing is just just knowing the two things. And, and one goes back to the thing I said in episode 22, which is forgive yourself for your weaknesses and double down on your strengths. And I think if you do that and you add self-awareness and practicality to it, you you will be happier. You will make more money um, and you will be more counterbalanced <laughs> in, like in your life. I like that. 
Cool. So let's, uh, you know, we've got these rapid fire questions at the end here. Um, sure. So again, the first thing that comes to mind, and I know we had some from episode 22. So if the answers are the same, then cool, but uh, feel free to pop something different if you've learned something new since the last sure. time we spoke. The first one, as you know, was what do you wish you'd been told in your 20s? I wouldn't have listened. I wouldn't have listened anyway. I, I, I needed I I needed I needed the 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 world to punch me in my mouth. I love that. I think that's my my favorite answer. <laughs> I needed the world to punch me in my mouth. Uh, what is the biggest opportunity for quarter lifers today? The internet, mm -hmm. just just connecting. And remind us again where we can go to connect with you. Um, Doug Stewart nine one nine dot com. And then that's my handle on all the various social places. Mm -hmm. Got it. And again, I'll link up all of that in the show notes. Doug, before I get to the final question, just want to take a second again, man, to acknowledge you. You have really become one of my favorite guys online. Um, and hopefully we get to meet up in person one day. But just acknowledge you for how you emphasize and prioritize family, even though you had you know a full-time job and the side hustle going on. Um, but just, you know, you're still making, uh, making a Kendall's graduation and um, having breakfast with her every morning. It's little things like that that I really appreciate about you um, and just that genuineness. Uh, the final question that I have is what one thing can listeners do this week to start creating their quarter life comeback? Do the first thing, whatever that is. Just do the first thing and start, start a journey. Doug Stewart, thank you so much for coming on the Quarter Life Comeback. You're an inspiration, man. Thank you, Brian. So there you have it, guys and girls. That wraps up episode 81 of the Quarter Life Comeback podcast. And a big, big thanks to Doug Stewart for coming on the show again and uh, sharing his really cool story with us. If you like this one as much as I did, please share it around on social media and shoot me a tweet at Brian Tier to let me know your biggest takeaway. For me, it was the fact that Doug had been building up his own business for six years on the side uh, while working a full-time job and uh, supporting his family until he built up the skills that he needed to take the plunge and do his own thing full-time. So just remaining patient and staying true to that vision of what he wanted to create. As always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in the show at bryantier.com slash 081 make sure you subscribe at quarterlifecomeback.com to get all these episodes and more as soon as they go live. Just a quick reminder of what I mentioned in the show. I am now looking to bring on an intern to help me run my business. And uh, in exchange, I will teach you how I do all these things and mentor you to achieving your own goals and supporting in any way I can. If you're interested, please shoot me an email, brian at bryantia.com and uh, we'll get in touch to speak about moving forward. Thank you so, so much for being here. I appreciate you as always. And until next week, keep creating your quarter life comeback. <laughs>